Well, Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4 is a difficult text. And as we attempt to uh, interpret it, we should be humble because there are different interpretations that have been taken of this text. And uh, I don't think that whatever interpretation we take, I don't think we should be divisive with other Christians in the church or among the people of God. There are three, it taught, Genesis 6 says that the sons of God uh, saw the daughters of men and uh, they chose uh, the daughters of, of men for themselves as wives and they married them. So the question is, who are the sons of God that are marrying the daughters of men? Well, there are three different interpretations. One is that the sons of God is a reference to the godly line of Seth. Cain killed Abel, so after Abel died, uh, Adam and Eve had relations and uh, Seth was born and Seth carried on the, the godly faith of Abel. So one idea is that the sons of God are, are the descendants of Seth marrying the daughters of men, the ungodly line of Cain. Second interpretation is that the sons of God refers to ange angels, angelic beings, intermarrying with humans. The third idea is that the sons of God are heroes from the mythical past, uh, tyrant kings. We have stories from the ancient Near East, for example. We have stories of a person by the name of Gilgamesh, and he was part God and part human and accomplished many mighty feats. So how do we, how do we uh, find the right interpretation? The exact expression, sons of God, only occurs four or five times in the Hebrew Bible. We have one occurrence here in Genesis 6. We have two occurrences in the introduction to the book of Job. In the introduction to the book of Job, we see God gathering in his heavenly court, his heavenly assembly with the angels. And the angels are called sons of God there. There's another occurrence in the book of Job, Job chapter 38, where God is challenging Job and he, he says, where were you when I created the world? When he created the world, the sons of God sang for joy. So it seems to, uh, there it also seems to be a very clear reference to uh, angelic beings. The last occurrence is in Aramaic in the book of Daniel. When the king looked into the furnace, he saw four, four people there, and it, it says that one looked like a son of God, which would mean a divine being, an angelic being. There are only five occurrences in the entire Bible where we have the exact expression, son of God or sons of God, and it always refers to angelic beings. We must distinguish this use from other places. There are other places in the Bible where they indicate that the relationship of a human to God is like a father-son relationship. So Adam and God have a father-son relationship. Uh, in, in the covenant that God makes with David, God and David have a father-son relationship. Uh, but it, it doesn't say that, it doesn't actually say that Adam is a son of God. It doesn't use that linguistic expression. And it doesn't say that David is a son of God. So the only time that linguistic expression occurs in the Bible, it always and very clearly refers to angelic beings. We also have the, we also have the witness of the New Testament. So there are two passages in the New Testament that refer to this. One is 2 Peter chapter 2, and the other is the book of Jude. And both of these texts are very closely related to each other. In 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter is talking about how difficult days are coming for the Christians, and there will be people who deny the faith, who, de who deny the truth about Jesus Christ, the truth about his work, who deny the gospel. There will be false teachers 
and they will bring corruption into the church and destruction into the church. What Peter does is he appeals to the Old Testament and he, he says, well, if God could deliver, if God could deliver his faithful people in difficult times in the Old Testament, then he will be able to do it in the New Testament as well. Peter refers to two examples in the Old Testament. One is the story of the angel, uh, of Genesis 6 and Noah, and the other is the story of Lot being rescued from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you look in the Greek text of 2 Peter, it's very clear that there are two examples and not three examples by the use of the word and. So if God did not spare the angels who sinned and he delivered Noah and he did not spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and he rescued Lot. So there are two examples joined by the word and and each example has two parts, a negative part and a positive part, a negative part and a positive part. So when Peter is talking about the angels who sinned, he's very clearly talking about Genesis chapter 6 because this is connected with the story of Noah. Some people say, well, no, he's not talking about Genesis 6. Well, then my question to them is, if Peter is trying to encourage his readers from well-known stories in the Old Testament, and if the angels who sinned is not Genesis 6, then where else is the story? There is no other story in the Old Testament uh, that it could be refer referring to. Some people think that it's the fall of Satan, but as we, we're going to see when we talk about that, there is no story, there is no story in the Old Testament that describes the fall of Satan. Peter is very clearly alluding to Genesis 6. Jude is doing the same thing, and it's very obvious in the book of Jude because he's talking about people who are false teachers, people who are going to deny the faith, and he also appeals to the Old Testament and shows how God delivered his people in the past, and he will do so in the future. He also refers to two events. He refers to angels who abandoned their proper Home, dwelling place, their proper home. He also talks about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, sin, and he says, since they, in the same way as these, committed strange immorality. Well, in the Greek text, the they refers to the angels. And the same way as these, the these refers to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So what the story of Genesis 6 has in common with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is that there's an abnormal form of sexuality going on. If God can deliver his people from even the strangest perversions, then he will deliver the, the people who are listening to Peter and the people who are listening to Jude. He will deliver us. Now, someone might come to me and say, well, Jesus in the Gospels says that the angels in heaven, neither marry nor are given in marriage. So it's impossible for uh, an angel to have physical relations with uh, human women. Well, they're not reading the Gospels accurately and clearly because Jesus is saying that when, he, in, the, in the resurrection, when Jesus returns at the end of history, we who are resurrected are not going to marry because we're going to be like the angels in heaven. Notice he says the angels in heaven, and Jude says they left their proper dwelling place. So there's no contradiction between Jesus and Jude. In heaven, the angels don't marry. In Jude, they abandoned their proper dwelling place, and they go to commit strange immorality. So there's no there's no confusion. So it seems very clear. Genesis 6 is telling us that these are angels who are marrying humans, and Jude and Peter are telling us that is the correct interpretation. The next piece is, who are the Nephilim? In verse 4 of Genesis 6, it says, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, 
when the sons of God had relations with human women and they bore children of them. End of sentence. New sentence. They were the heroes who were from the ancient past men of renown. There's two major sentences there. First one says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. There are two possible interpretations of this expression. They were on the earth in those days and afterward. What does that mean? They were there in those days and afterward. Well, some people think this means that the Nephilim were the children that came from the angels who married the women in Genesis 6, verses 1 to 3, and that the Nephilim were the product of these unnatural unions, and they appeal to texts from the 3rd century B.C. and 2nd century B.C., the so-called Enochic traditions, the traditions about Enoch, where the Nephilim are interpreted as giants. There's another interpretation that's possible. When it says the Nephilim were there in those days and also afterward, it could mean that before the, hu the angels had sex with the human women, the Nephilim were there, and they were also there after the, hum the angels had sex with women. So it could mean that the Nephilim had nothing to do with the angels marrying the humans. I think that is the correct interpretation for two reasons. First of all, I examined every occurrence of this expression and also afterward. I, I went to the Hebrew Bible, I looked up every occurrence of this phrase, and I examined how it was used. And the second interpretation best fits and suits how this word is used. So when it says they were there in those days and also afterward, it means the Nephilim were there before angels cohabited with humans and they were there after angels cohabited with humans. There's a second reason why this is the correct interpretation. The last sentence says they were the heroes who were from the ancient past, the men of renown. This sentence does not begin with and. Now that's very, very important. Almost every sentence in the Hebrew Bible begins with and. When a sentence does not begin with and, it, it does so for two reasons. It could, be, it could be because it's beginning a new section, or secondly, because it's making a comment on the previous sentence, what we would call a footnote. It's very clear that this sentence is not beginning a new section, but it's acting like a footnote on the previous sentence. So the previous sentence is saying that the Nephilim were, before, were there before the angels and the humans cohabited, and they were there after. And it's making a brief comment that they were the ancient heroes. In this case, what Moses is doing is he's demythologizing the Nephilim. You notice, one of the things that we should notice is the text doesn't tell us who the Nephilim were. What does that mean? Why doesn't, the why doesn't the text tell us who they were? Because they were well known to the first readers of this text. The first readers of this text knew who the Nephilim were and didn't need, didn't need that explained to them. And all Moses is saying is, look, whoever you think these heroes are like Gilgamesh, these ancient heroes, these men of renown, you've read about them in the ancient mythologies. Whoever they were, they're not part of this story. They don't come from the cohabitation of angels and humans. And I think that's the correct interpretation. But, but the problem is, this has been a difficult text to interpret. And it has not always been interpreted correctly down through the centuries. And in the 3rd century B.C. and the 2nd century B.C., they came to an incorrect interpretation. They thought that the Nephilim were giants who were produced by angels cohabiting with humans. And this got into the book of Enoch. And Paul warns his readers against this because he says in his letters to Timothy, don't argue 
over endless genealogies and foolish myths. This is a direct reference to the book of, en of Enoch, which has a long genealogy of all the angels until you finally come down to Satan, and then they blame all the evil in the world on Satan. What they're trying to do is they're trying to blame chaos and death and evil in the world on angelic sin instead of blaming it on human sin. And the Bible clearly puts the, the blame on humans. Genesis 3 shows how sin came into the world. How did we live in a world that is troubled by chaos, by death, by evil, by sin, by selfishness, by all kinds of corruption. That came about because God made a covenant with the first humans and they broke that covenant. They were fickle, they were disloyal, they were unfaithful, they cheated on God in the relationship and they rebelled against him. And so uh, when Jude quotes and refers to this material, he's showing that it's the sin is in the world because of, because of human rebellion, not because of angelic sin. Thanks for watching Honest Answers. Don't forget to subscribe 